It's all right. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. Um, I titled my message this morning, A New Husband, A New Heart. And I hope that by the time I'm done preaching, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Because some of you guys are probably saying, hey, man, I'm not looking for a husband, much less a new one, right? <laughs> First Samuel chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. It says, And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him, and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance, but the man was curlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. Just to give you a little bit of a background, I mean, we're going to read a little bit more, but I didn't want to read the whole passage of Scripture because it was really a lot. I just wanted you to understand where King David is. This story is about King David, and it's showing us a, a piece of his life. And during this time frame of his life, he was living in the countryside. He and, he and a band of men that had gathered themselves to him were living on the countryside because David was on the run from King Saul. Saul was still on the throne at that time, and David had been anointed king, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more in a second, but David had been anointed king, but he wasn't sitting on the throne yet, as of yet. Saul was still sitting on the throne. Saul wanted to kill David, and uh, on more than one occasion, David and his men had protected this man Nabal's livestock as they were in the countryside, because, you know, just... Like there are today, there were poachers back in that day, and they would try to, uh, you know, steal people's belongings. But, but David and his men would protect the, the possessions of what belong, rightfully belonged to people out there. You know, there's a lot of spiritual typology in this passage. I don't mean to get ahead of myself, and I'm going to explain it a little bit more when we get to it. But I want you to know that the Bible teaches us, or I, I believe that the Bible opens up to us and explains that David is a type of Christ. And, I'll, and, and he's a type of also the Spirit of God. He's a type of also the believer that's trusting in the Spirit of God. A believer that's wanting to go towards God's will. Whereas Saul, on the other hand, King Saul is a type of the flesh. And he's a type of, because he's a type of whenever the believer wants to go towards his own will or we can also look at the flesh, not only is it when we go to want, want to go towards our own will, but when we attempt to uh, fight spiritual battles in our own strength, if that makes any sense right there. So there was a time that David and his men needed some provisions. So he sent some of his men to ask this man, Nabal, because he had great possessions, uh, if he would supply them with what they needed. A little bit more explanation on Saul as flesh, David as, uh, as the spirit. Whenever we talk about battling the enemy, because I, I just mentioned about being in our own strength, right? And uh, Saul, he wanted David, if you'll remember, I'm talking about Goliath now. You know, this isn't in the story here, but, but I want to remind you in the story of David and Goliath, Saul wanted David to fight Goliath his way. Y'all remember the story? Do you, do you remember? I don't want to go through the whole thing again, but essentially David walked up on a scene, and I really do love this scene because I think that it's so indicative, really, of where we are in the church today and even in our own spiritual lives at times. That I've said it many times, and if you've heard it multiple times, then just bear with me, but the same thing was happening every day for 40 days. That the children of Israel would get dressed up and they would get themselves in what they called battle array, kind of like an army that was ready to march in to fight. But the same thing would happen that they were on one side of the valley of Elah and the Philistines were on another side of the valley. And Goliath, I can just see him taking a nap and waking up when the sun hit his face and everybody's hollering and screaming and he wipes the old nasty stuff off his beard. He walks to the edge of the valley and he says, just send somebody over here. 
Send somebody over here to fight me and, and we'll just be done with all of this. And what happens is, is that Israel, nobody can, they can't produce a man to go fight Goliath. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that, is that that many times is, is the life of believers. We want to have faith. We want to have the cry of victory. We believe what the word of God says, that the word of God says that we have victory. But yet many times in our life, we cower under fear. We cower because we don't understand how to really walk in victory. Victory. And repeatedly, day after day, the same thing is happening. And every day, the children of Israel get up as though it's a new day, but the same thing keeps on happening. And young David walks into the camp, and he sees this going on, and he cannot believe what he sees. He's really appalled by it, to be honest with you, because like I've said on multiple occasions, he's been living a whole different life. Hallelujah. Yeah. David's been living a whole different life. He's been living in the field. He's writing psalms to the Lord. He's playing his harp. He's spending time in praise and worship to the Lord. And whenever the enemy tries to come against him, whether it be a lion or a bear, young David trusts God and he goes into the battle and he, got, he comes out victorious. Yeah. But it's because he's trusting in the Lord. Amen. Because he knows that he can't kill a bear with his own hands without the help of God. But yet with the help of God... He can be victorious. But yet when it comes time for this, once David opens up his mouth and says, nobody's going to take him up on this, and the king's going to give his daughter to be my wife, where point me to the battle. And what happens is, is that Saul tries to dress David in his armor. You know, I think that there's a picture out there, it's probably been on Facebook or something, of some young boy, and it talks about the armor of God, and he's got like this, this oversized armor, and it's just like floating on him, you know? And essentially, that's what the story goes, because David said, I, I can't wear this. I mean, Saul was a big man. The Bible says he was, he was shoulders above the crowd, you know? And I can imagine that this, this armor, like, you know, his, whatever the case, it, it didn't fit it. And David said, this, this is not proven. I, I cannot fight this way. Right. David talked about it, and that's when he told him. He said, listen, when I was in the field, the lion came, the bear came, the Lord gave me the strength that I needed to overcome them. And guess what? The same's going to happen with this uncircumcised Philistine today. That's what I'm basing the spirit versus the flesh on. That in my in my surmise, that's what I base Saul as flesh. An attempt to gain victory in the battle through your own wisdom. You think that you're going to figure things out. You're going to make a decision. You're going to make a choice. And by doing this, you're going to fix the problems that you've been having. No, your wisdom is foolishness in the eyes of God. My wisdom is foolishness in the eyes of God. Our strength cannot stand against the enemy. I don't care how strong we think we are, how bad we think we are. We cannot stand and fight a spiritual fight Amen. in the flesh. It wasn't working, Saul. Why are you gonna? You're, why didn't you put your own armor on and go fight Goliath? <laughs> why do you want to try to put your your armor on young David? No, let him fight the fight that he knows is gonna win. And so that's what we see: the flesh versus the spirit. Saul is a type of the flesh. David is a type of the spirit. And at this time frame, again, Saul, the flesh, is reigning as king in the kingdom. Whenever they're going, whenever the, David and his men are in the countryside, they, Saul is still on the throne. Flesh is reigning. I'm talking about in the individual Christian life. Sometimes Saul is still sitting as king on the throne of the heart. Yes. We can't find the victory that we so badly seek and so badly desire. And David, he's, he represents the spirit. And like I've sa I said already, he's already been anointed as king. And Nabal now, I'm about to read another passage of scripture. Nabal, Nabal is, is, is presented a choice in his life. And just like you and I as Christians are always presented a choice in our life to choose who we're going to serve. To make a choice whether or not we're going to serve the flesh Amen. or whether or not we're going to serve the spirit. Amen. Nabal, unfortunately, chooses flesh. This is his response. 1 Samuel 25, 10 through 13. Remember, David's servants go to ask for provision. Nabal answered David with David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my share? Listen, it was not, it was common knowledge 
It had been voiced abroad. People knew. It had, it had reached the ears of the country folk that there was a change that had taken place in the kingdom. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? You, it doesn't take long for the word to get out. You know what I'm saying? Like whenever something happens on the uh, that's significant, oh, yeah. listen, they didn't have Facebook back then, but it doesn't take long for word to get out when something significant happens. And let me tell you something. They might have tried to keep it quiet in that little town of Bethlehem. I, I love this story. But when David was anointed to be king, they can try to keep it quiet all they want. But look, the, the prophet of God showed up in that little bitty town. And, and they went through to, to anoint each one of Jesse's boys. And the prophet said, each time, it's not this one. And they had to call young David from the field. And then they poured that horn of oil on top of his head. And it dripped down. And he was anointed to be king. Listen, I'm telling you right now, the word had gotten out. Nabal knew that David was anointed to be king. And they knew that Saul was in rebellion. And David's running for his life. Nabal is making a choice to serve his flesh. Because he feels like it's what, hey, look, it's one of these things. It's like whatever's best for me right now. Yeah. Saul's on the throne. I'm gonna I'm, whatever's best for me right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna serve my best. What's best for my interests? It says, "Shall I take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and given unto men whom I know not whence they be?" So David's young men turned their way and went again, and came and told him all these things. And David said unto his men, "Gird ye on every man his sword." And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword, and they went up after David, about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. They're going, this, this is words of war right here. And they're going to deal with this flesh, amen? They're going, cut it off. All right, so Nabal chooses flesh, but I want you to see Abigail chooses the spirit. She's Nabal's wife. She heard what was going on, and she ended up intercepting the situation and she brought the provisions to David when she heard from her servant what was happening. And she asked that David would be merciful in 1 Samuel chapter 25 verses 23 through 25. This is Abigail it says, and when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass. That's King James version for donkey. Okay. And fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground. So if we got Saul is a type of the flesh. And we have David sometimes being a type of the believer walking in the spirit, but also sometimes a type of the Lord, type of Christ. Abigail is a type of the bride of Christ. She's a type of, because in this story, I don't mean to get ahead of myself, but in this story, she's going to get her a new husband. She's going to marry, she's going to end up becoming married to David. But the idea is, is that spiritually speaking, she represents the bride of Christ. She represents the believer that comes to the Lord. She, she comes to the Lord. She bows herself before the king. She surrenders herself and she bows herself down. But look what she says. She fell at his feet. She said, upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. You know, one of the things that I like about what Abigail says right there. I mean, I realize that she's connected to Nabal, right? I mean, when a man and a woman become one, they become one flesh. That's what the word of God says. But she sees herself in such a way as bearing the brunt of the responsibility. And even though it was Nabal, her husband, she sees herself as bearing the brunt of the responsibility. What I like about that is, and I'm trying to just use it in terms that all of us can understand and all of us can, can, can realize that we've done it at some point in time or of our lives. How many times have we tried to justify our actions? Always. You know what I'm talking about? I know I have. I don't need to look at you. <laughs> I'm just trying to say that there have been so many times that I have tried to justify my actions. That doesn't work with God. Who do we think we're kidding? You know, know what I'm saying? God sees everything. He's the one that wrote his word. And whenever we've read it, we know what it says. But yet at the same time, we'll try to justify our own. Yeah, but da, 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 da. No, that doesn't fly. There's right and there's wrong. And sometimes we choose flesh over the spirit. Abigail says, let this iniquity be upon me. She bows herself down to the Lord. Listen, true repentance requires that we take responsibility for the choices that we make. 
And that we bow ourselves to the Lord and we surrender to his will. We want, we want the spirit of God moving in our life. We want Jesus moving in our life, giving us revelation, giving us victory. Amen. So that we can overcome the enemy so that, so that death can be arrested and so that new life can begin. Well, in order for that to happen, we, we got to quit justifying the actions that we make. Or that we choose whenever we're choosing flesh. And instead, let this iniquity be upon me, Lord. But at the same time, for the New Testament believer, remove it from me, Lord. Amen. <laughs> remove it from me. Yeah. And then she says, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience. And hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For his name is so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. You know, can I tell you something? Whenever a woman is married to a man, they do become one flesh. But let me just give you a little bit of freedom in your life. If your man's trying to get you to go contrary to the word of God, I'm just saying, or, or vice versa. Your woman's trying to get you to go contrary to the word of God. Can I tell you? That that is not God's will, but that instead it's God's will that we be faithful to the king. Amen. That we be married to the king and that we be faithful to him and that we bow to him and we surrender to him. So I don't know. I'm not saying that any man in this church would think that way. You know, that 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 that, that it would be OK. If what I say goes. No, what you say doesn't go, sir. Yeah, we don't have time to get into Ephesians right now, but. What you say doesn't go, sir. The Lord may have put you to be the head of your house, but that's as you're following after God's will. That's as you're seeking the face of God. Not that you're leading your wife astray from the will of God. No, that's not God's will. Amen. That's what he was doing. So now let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 35. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him and said unto her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have hearkened to your voice and I have accepted your person. You know, I didn't have this in my notes, but let me just tell you this. If you will bow yourself to the Lord, if you will not try to justify your actions, but instead you will come clean with Jesus. Amen. You, you know, you don't have to come clean with a man. I mean, you just don't. I don't believe in all that accountability partner stuff. I'm not. I understand what the word of God says. Confess your sins one to another. But at the same time, who you really need, what it's talking about is you should be able to share. You should be able to have brothers and sisters in the Lord that you can confide in, that can pray with you. But if you think that the answer to victory in your life is you sharing all your deep, dark secrets with another human being, I got news for you. Half the time, you can't even trust them because they're going to throw your business out there. Yeah, and I'm talking about church folk that even mean well. We don't have time to start talking about gossip. You know, we talk about that a good bit. But for some reason, the proverb says it's like a juicy morsel. And I've experienced that. I don't understand why it is that it feels so good sometimes to talk about other people's business because our flesh likes it so much. Anyway, I didn't mean to get into that. I'm just trying to say this, that you what you got to come clean to is the Lord. Amen. The, David said that the Lord desires truth on the inward parts. Amen. That, that means that God can see. He peers into the heart and he knows the heart of man. He knows what's going on in there. And David said that God wants us to come clean with him. Amen. All right. So it says right here in 1 Samuel. Now we're going to 20. Still in 25. We're going verses 36 through 40. This is kind of like the end of the, where, the story where, we're, where we are. here. Abigail came to Nabal after she had been with David and. Behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was married within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing. She didn't tell him anything while he was drunk about the encounter that she had with David. Less or more until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him. It, it's clear to me from a medical perspective that what happened was that he had that, that the Lord caused him to have a heart attack. Uh -huh. It says his heart died within him and he became as a stone and it came to pass about 10 days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord that has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal. 
and has kept his servant from evil. You know, that's another thing. This isn't in my notes, but I just wanted to tell you that if you feel like somebody's done your wrong, you don't have to try to get vengeance for yourself. You, you know that? I mean, this is a whole lot easier said and it's a whole lot easier preached than it is to be lived. But I have to tell you that if somebody has wronged you and you are the child of God, then listen, sometimes God allows things to come your way. Amen. Sometimes God will open up the door and allow a little controversy, some trials some tribulation to come your way because he wants to use it to bring some correction in your life. But at the same time, if you are the child of God... Don't think that people that do you wrong are going to go, that their, that their actions are going to go unanswered. But it's not your job to try to get vengeance in, in your own strength, but instead to trust God. And you're not supposed to say, oh, Lord, I don't believe this anyway. Oh, Lord, he calls a fire upon my enemy's head. I don't think that that's the right motive. I think that instead we're to pray for our enemies. Amen. Whenever people are against us and people are talking bad about us. We are to try. Listen, when you realize that your heart's not wrong, I know that, but this is good. I know it's not in my nose, but I know it's good because it's the word of God. It's the heart of the Lord. When somebody's against you and bitterness tries to rise up inside of your heart, it will destroy you. That's right. If you allow bitterness to take root in your heart and your heart becomes hard, you'd be just like Nabal. Your heart will die within you. Bitterness will be like a heart attack on you. It'll be like a plague in your life, be like mold in your walls. It won't stop. It'll continue to grow and it'll continue to take over. Your heart will be so hard you won't even realize it. But one day, you, you, you won't even be able to feel the presence of God. You, you will be past. Your conscience will be seared. You gotta, we have to learn how to truly. Listen, if you don't even feel it, if you feel anger and you feel bitterness towards someone, you got to be able to recognize that. and You got to be able to say, God, do something in my heart. Toward, I don't want this in my heart. Does that make sense what I'm saying? The Lord uh, has return, ha hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spoke unto her saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. So the literal meaning of this story, like I said already, is, is a snapshot in the life of King David, who was Israel's most powerful king. And the Bible teaches us that David was a man after God's own heart. Now, listen, David made some mistakes. I don't, I don't know why I always feel like I got to over explain things just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Because if I struggled with it in my walk with God, surely you have too. But look at what David did. He, he committed adultery and he, and, he, and he killed Uriah the Hittite, which was Bathsheba's husband. How could he be a man after God's heart? Listen to me. If you read the Bible in context, what you're going to realize is that every king after him, starting with his son Solomon... Worshipped false gods or, or built altars, erected altars to false gods. And David's heart said, no, there's one true God. I will worship him and worship him alone. Every child of God has things in their life. And God sees what's in our life. But David had a heart after God because David desired to serve God, to worship him. And that his name would be proclaimed. So the literal meaning, once again, is that it's a snapshot. He's the most powerful king that Israel ever had. And he has such a special... I want you to see how what a special place David has in God's heart. I believe that, man. Look, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The first verse of the New Testament has the name David in it. And it's connected to Jesus. Look, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. The son of Abraham. It connects him to Israel, but not only to Israel, it connects him to the lineage of the king, the king that God chose for Israel. But not only that, the very last chapter of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So we see the importance of the life of David to the history of Israel, but also the plan of God in this time of his life, he's on the run from Saul. As I said, Saul was still king, but it was just a matter of time when he would be replaced by David. Saul had been disobedient to God, and God had chosen to replace him with David. 
All the formalities had been done. David had already been anointed. The ceremony had been done. It was just a matter of time where Saul was removed and David was to take his place on the throne. So one of the things that I would say to you is, is that maybe you're in a place spiritually where you would say, I believe what the word of God says. I want King David to sit on the throne of my heart, typo, typo, typologically speaking. I want Jesus, I want the spirit of God to sit on the throne of my heart. I want to be led by the Lord. I want to go in the right direction. But yet it still seems like Saul is sitting on the throne of my heart. I just want to encourage you and let you know the Bible, Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Don't let go of trusting in Christ and what Christ has done for you that will release grace into your life to strengthen you, amen, to give you overcoming victory. Praise God, continue to hold on to the Lord. Amen. You know, it's not really what I'm preaching on this morning, but this is, I guess you could say, a sub point too. We've already had a couple of them, but David has already been anointed king. But yet there's this time frame of waiting. And sometimes in the wait, just like it was with David, there's some serious conflict going on. And sometimes God maybe has promised something to your heart. If it lines up with his word, amen. But yet you have not experienced it. You have it and you feel great conflict and great distress while you're in the midst of it. I have to tell you that many times there's a waiting before the promise comes. Yet at the same time, you got, we got to keep on holding on to the Lord. Keep on trusting in the Lord. Listen, where, you know what I would say is to, to all of this? Yeah, but what if, preacher, all I do is hold on to the Lord and wait as every day goes by. And then the end of my life comes. Guess what? You stayed faithful to the Lord. Amen. You lived according to the Spirit of God. You might not have got everything that you wanted on this earth. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes people don't. Listen, I don't, I don't expect that everybody's going to like the way that I feel that the Lord tells me to present the gospel. Some, can I be honest with you? Sometimes I don't like the way it comes out. Sometimes I don't like the way of what I read. Because what it tells me and what it teaches me is, once again, I don't get everything that I want on this side. I'm not always going to be ecstatic and happy. Listen, that's what the, that's what the word of, but that doesn't mean that I can't have peace. Amen. That doesn't mean that I still can't have the joy of the Lord Amen. as I'm walking and following after the spirit of God. Because the reality of it is, is that sometimes or many times whenever I don't feel the peace of God, when I don't feel the joy of the Lord, it's because I'm so caught up in the desires of what I want of my selfishness rather than being swallowed up in the will of my master Amen. and whenever I will yield myself and my members to the will of my master then the joy of the Lord hallelujah is my strength yes. and that's what the Beatitudes were about it was about a joy that came from the outside it wasn't something that I'm sorry it was a joy that came from within it, it comes from within, from the Lord. It's not like you're going to be able to bring stuff unto yourself to, to make yourself happy. I don't care what you try to bring from the outside and connect yourself to. The likelihood is, is that if you're looking to that particular thing or situation to bring you happiness and joy, can I tell you that you're going to be left empty each and every time. You're going to be left disappointed each and every time because it's only the Lord and his will for your life Amen. that's going to bring you happiness. Amen. The enemy of our lives like Saul in the life of David combats us and comes against us and attempts in so many ways to destroy the plan of God for our lives. But if we will hold on to the promise of God, he will prevail in our lives and give us the victory according to his will. So in reality, that's where David is. Saul wants to kill him, and to some extent he's on the run, and in the midst of this time in his life, he has an encounter with this man named Nabal. And on a spiritual level, I can see many connections to our walk contained in this passage. Some of them I might have already explained, but let's just go through them. First, number one, Abigail, her name means my father is my joy, or my father is the source of my joy. So Abigail, 
whose name means my father is the source of my joy, is married to a man named Nabal, whose name means fool. Wow. And the Bible says he's curlish, churlish, however you want to pronounce it, which means he's hard <clears throat> or severe. So she's married in her first marriage to a fool who's hard and severe. You know, before we're saved, we're kind of like Abigail and that we're disconnected from the life of grace that we need for joy. Even though her name is my father is my source of joy, I guarantee you she's in the midst of a situation where she could very easily feel down. The, the, the husband that she's married to is a man that's very harsh and severe and tries to hold her down. How can we embrace the joy of our father when we're under the control of a fool who treats us severely and harshly? I mean, does that not remind you? I can remember some of the darkest times of my life, man. Right before the Lord got a hold of me. I'm talking about when I first got saved. I'm not talking about my second salvation. <laughs> second time that the Lord really got a hold of me. But the first time, man, it was so dark. And I was so oppressed by the enemy. And I, never, and I, I didn't know how I was going to get free. I had heard the gospel before, but I had somewhat ignored it. Hallelujah, though, that God knew exactly where I was and he knew exactly how to bring me where I needed to get to. Amen. And it was just a matter of me being willing to surrender my life to the will of God and to say, yes, Jesus, I want you. I don't want this anymore. I don't want to be married to Nabal anymore. Amen. I'm tired of how harsh and severe he is. I'm tired of the fact that he keeps stealing my joy. I want my father to be my joy. The death of her first husband, Nabal, is like the death of our old man. And like Abigail was freed from the bondage of her first husband and the life she had, when we're born again, we are freed from the bondage of our own life. I got about three different scriptures from the New Testament that I was going to talk to you. Just share with you real quick about this conversion experience. Look at Galatians 2.20. Did you know that your old man died with Jesus? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, the first birth, the first marriage, you, when you came into faith with Christ, in Christ, you, the Bible teaches that the Father sees you in union with Him, and that your old man died. The relationship with your old man died. Look at Colossians 3.3, 3. for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ mm. in God. Hallelujah. Look at Romans 6.6. 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And her marriage to David is like our new life with Jesus. And that brings me to my first point. This is point number one. Y'all ready? Dead to one and married to another. The Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 6 that when we become born again, the relationship that we had with sin died. But I want you to see something in Romans chapter 7 because I believe that Romans chapter 7 and the first four verses are a perfect New Testament thought that connects itself to the marriage that Abigail had with Nabal. Look at Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 4. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Let, let, me, let me just try to explain a little bit, because sometimes Romans chapter 7 can be pretty wordy, and it can, it can be sometimes complicated for people whenever, you, whenever they don't know a whole lot you know, necessarily about the Bible, that they haven't been in the faith for a long time. The law of God... What was it the word of God that was given to the Old Testament Jewish people? And the law of God explained the character of God to the people of God. 
The whole Bible does that for us. It explains to us the character of God. It explains to us the heart of God. It explains to us what he likes, what he loves, what he hates, right? And the law of God was written and it was given to God's people. God was, was, will judge mankind based off of his law. When you're born the first time, that's why you must be born again. That's why it requires a new birth. Because if you're because when you're born the first time, if you die that way, whether you knew the law or not, you're going to be judged according to the law. People may not like it. They might say, well, that's not fair. Hold on a second. It's God's word. God put it in writing. God allowed it to be printed. God allowed it to be copied. God allowed it to be circulated. It's his word. It's his earth. And he allowed mankind to be aware of it. And the law will hold mankind guilty. If you die outside of Jesus, then you're going to be judged based on the law. And can I tell you what the law says? The law says you ain't going to keep it. The law was as a schoolmaster. It, its purpose was like a, a, a tutor. The idea is it's not so much. I used to think that I don't have a ruler. I wish I did because I'd slap my hand with it. I used, to, I used to think it was kind of like, you ever watched The Little House on the Prairie? <laughs> Poor little Laura Ingalls. She was always the one getting in trouble, and it was really that old, what was her name? Polly, what was her name? Polly. She was really, y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm so old. <laughs> all right, never mind. Polly would act like she's all sweet, but anyway, she's, the teacher would say, put your hand up, and slap her hand with that ruler. That's how they did it back in the day. I used to think that that's what the idea was behind the, yeah. the schoolmaster, but that's not what the idea is. The idea is, is that the law served a purpose. The, it was like, it's really more like a nanny, our idea of a nanny, but it was a person that was in charge of the upbringing of a child. It's almost like it was holding the hand of humanity. I'm getting way too deep right now. But it's like it was holding the hand of the, of the human race through the Jewish people till we got to Jesus. Yeah. Right. It, it, this is the time frame of salvation history. God gave the law to his people, the, the Israelite people. And until Jesus came and acted as a nanny, a caretaker for the human race. But listen, if you die out until Jesus came, it was a, its intent was to, to get us to Jesus. It was, its intent was also to show us that we couldn't keep it. That you were born under the law because in your first birth, everybody's born under the law. And this is what God requires. God says, you shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not desire somebody else's wife and somebody else's, I don't know, Mercedes Benz AMG or whatever it is. You shall not covet things that do not belong to you. So even if you felt like you checked off the first eight, you failed in the last two. Point being is, is that if you die that way, you're going to be judged. Yeah. You get the point that I'm making? I'm trying to explain this stuff in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Because it's talking about it like being a marriage. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which has a husband, Abigail, husband named Nabal, a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she's loosed from that law of her husband. So a death severed the relationship. Amen. Do you get it? All right, we're not done yet. But if the husband be dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you ought the whole thing is spiritual right here. <laughs> He's using a truth yes. in the law to describe a spiritual truth. He says, wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. 
Romans chapter 6 teaches us that we were born the first time under the bondage of sin, but that when we came into faith with Christ, that we died with Jesus at Calvary, we were buried with him in the tomb, and just as he was resurrected to newness of life, we too are resurrected to a new life, amen, and we're no longer under the bondage of sin. Amen. Romans 7 teaches us that, that, that death severed that first marriage that we had where we were called, where we were under the law, we were being judged according to the law. Listen, the law says you better perform or else you're going to be guilty. That's why some of you have been living a life of condemnation and guilt. Because you under the impression that your, that your righteousness or your right standing with God is in some way, or maybe not people in this church, but people on the camera, that your life in some way or your righteousness in some way is measured based on what you do. No, that's law. Law, law demands that you perform. Grace says Jesus performed. You put your faith in what Christ has done. And he liberates you. And now you're under grace instead of under law. You, you, your first marriage was dissolved whenever you died in Christ. Listen, the, the thing that happened was is that death severed that first relationship. Just as Nabal died, you and I died in Christ. And death severed the relationship and the relationship with sin is severed. The relationship with law is severed. And instead of being under law, you're under grace. Look what it says. So that you could be married to Christ. Married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. That we should bring forth fruit unto God. See, in this new relationship, God wants you, God wants you to bear fruit. You know what it's talking about here? You have some children. Spiritually speaking, yes. your, your first relationship, you died. Now you married Jesus. Jesus wants to impregnate you with some fruit. He, he wants some fruit for the kingdom to come out of you. But if you're living under law and you're expecting it based on your performance, you're going to frustrate the grace of God. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Abigail was a lovely woman whose spirit cried out to be free and live according to her name that the father would be her joy. She had a heart that was soft towards the king. But as long as she was married to Nabal, she was entangled in bondage and she couldn't be free. In Romans 7, Paul teaches us that when we were born again, we were released from the law. We were released from the bondage. We can put trust and faith in what Christ has done and watch the fruit of God be produced in our life. That was point number one. Point number two is living under law will frustrate God's grace. Listen, if you refuse to release yourself from the, from the burden of law, a lot of times people in our church, maybe they don't, I hope you understand what I'm talking about. What I'm trying to say is, I, I don't know, I don't know how to, I, I think, sometimes I think that I'm, I'm so used to talking about it that I think that it's an easy thing to understand. But in reality, I don't know that it is. I remember whenever, before I really understood any of this stuff, I can remember like struggling so bad and going to Walmart one time. And I know I've shared this story and I'm sorry about bore you with my story. I went to Walmart and this guy, this guy was like, hey, dude, I hadn't, hadn't seen you in a while. And immediately I put my head down. I was like, yeah, I need to get back to church. I need to get back into word. I need to start praying again. Can, can I tell you that all that's true? Like you, you should be in the house of God. You should be in the word of God. Amen. You should be spending time in prayer. Amen. But that wasn't what my problem was. Yeah. At that point in time in my life, I thought that my Christian walk was, was all dependent upon what I did. And that whenever I woke up on that day, if I didn't get in my quota of Bible reading, then I had failed God and condemnation instead of freedom. I was married to Nabal again. He was severe and hard in my life. And, and I did not experience the freedom that I desired. But when the Lord breathed fresh in my life and began to explain to me, no, 
I took the penalty. I removed condemnation and guilt. Grace is a different covenant. You put your faith in what I have done. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to pour life into you. And through that, you're going to have a desire to know me more. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. Whether you're experiencing it right now or not in your life, when you begin to experience the grace of God setting you free, when you begin to experience the victory of God in your life, you're going to want to learn more about it. Amen. You're going to want to know more about it. Amen? Amen. But living under law will frustrate God's grace. Look at Galatians 2.21. The apostle Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Do y'all understand what I'm trying to say? Sometimes I feel like I can't explain myself. <laughs> when I say law, I know you're not over there quoting the Ten Commandments and trying to put your faith in, I shall not commit adultery, I shall not lie. But do you understand that law is connected to performance? And when you make rules and regulations in your life and you try to live according to a set of rules and you fail that set of rules that you create for yourself, that that is the same thing as trying to live according to the Ten Commandments and failing and that you will feel condemnation and guilt. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Amen. Have you ever had a desire to do something for God? Have you ever had a desire to be free from a bondage in your life, but no matter how hard you try, you just can't seem to get free? Amen. So many times it's because our faith is in the wrong place. Yes. We're trusting yes. in our own strength. We're trusting in our own willpower. <laughs> oh, I ain't going to go over there. I'm not going to do that. No, you ain't. You're not going to do anything in your own strength. Listen, when sin's got you by the backside... It will be your taskmaster and it will tell you exactly where you're going to go and exactly what you're going to. Oh, you listen, you think you got it licked. You think, oh, yeah, but I, I said no this time. Wait, if you're not delivered from the power of sin by the grace of the Holy Spirit, that thing will lay dormant in your life for one year, two years, three years, four years. Five years. That thing will come back to bite you when you thought that you were set free from it. And it will get you when you least expect it. And it will cause you to come back under his bondage. It will be a taskmaster. It will be your master. But listen, Jesus can set you free. Amen. Amen. Jesus will set you free when you want to be free. Hallelujah. We trust in what we do instead of what we did. Or we hold on to a little bit of it because we don't want to give in completely to God. Has anybody ever been there before? Oh, I know I'm preaching better than your amen. And I know I've been going a long time already and I've already used my quota of words and I've probably worn you down. But let me tell you something. That right there is just the truth. There's a lot of times that we don't want to let go completely because you know what? We like something. This little thing right here makes me feel good and I don't want to let go of it. And it's comfortable in my life. And I just want to hold it and I want to squeeze it and I want to pet it because because it makes me feel good. Well, guess what? You go on and hold on to that. But until you let go of that, that's just the same thing as trying to operate in the law. You're still frustrating grace. You know what the word frustrate means? To set it aside. You're setting it aside. When you hold on to that thing in your life, or you're trusting in the wrong thing in your own strength and your own willpower, you're setting aside the grace of God, the hard work that Jesus performed to set you free. He did it. He said it is finished. It's a completed work. That provides us with the grace that we need in order to walk in victory. But many times, we set it aside. All right, point number three. Last point. One is going to have to go. Can't be married to both of them. We aren't going to be able to live in the flesh and the spirit at the same time. The flesh and the spirit of God are literally at war with one another. You look at Galatians 5.17. The flesh lusts against the spirit. That word lust, it means a strong desire. The word literally, believe it or not, can be a good thing, depending on the context. It just means a strong desire. So in other words, if it's talking about something good, then it means a strong desire for something good. So right here, the flesh lusts against the spirit. It has a desire to go against what the spirit of God wants. Your flesh wants to go in an opposite direction of what God wants for your life. And the spirit, it goes against what the flesh wants for your life. These two are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. When you allow and give into the flesh, I'm telling you right now, you give it strength. Every time you give into the flesh, you give it strength. And it's like throwing gas on a fire. 
the embers and the coals were just barely glimmering and now you give in to the flesh and you let it flame up again. The word contrary means to be opposed. The Holy Spirit is not going to condone the flesh. We need to remember that God paid a high price for us to be free from the flesh. Amen. Amen. When you need freedom in your life, it's a simple formula. Jesus died to save you. Jesus died to set you free from bondage. Faith in him and his finished work on the cross will release grace into your life. Grace will set you free. Amen. Can I repeat that again? Because I know that's a lot of words. When you want freedom in your life, it's simple. Jesus died to save us, but he also died to set us free from bondage. Faith in him. You know, sometimes like I've had so many conversations with some people so many times. And I know it's the Holy Spirit, that's, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's got to give somebody revelation. Amen. 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 That's why I love Brother Larson so much. I feel like he's got a special anointing on his on his ministry. That he speaks the truth, but the Holy Spirit, Lord, help me. <laughs> help the anointing of the Holy Spirit to open Amen. people's eyes. Amen. Because until the Holy Spirit gives you revelation, you can't see it. Amen. There's people that I've talked to so many times about this truth. And yet at the same time, they'll say something like, oh, what we got to have is the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to walk in victory on the earth today. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. I'm all about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to preach the gospel without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Say whatever you want, but I, there is a difference between somebody that's filled with the Holy Ghost and preaching and somebody that's not. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the access to victory on earth today mm -hmm. comes through continued faith yeah. in the finished work of Jesus yes. Yes. that gives you a position of righteousness in the eyes of the Father and allows a release of grace into your life. Yes. Grace Amen. is what gives you victory. That's the thing that changes everything. It's the presence of God. God moving and, and, and altering circumstances and setting free and delivering and freeing you from chains of bondage. It's the Holy Spirit that does the work. And He works based on what Jesus has already done. Jesus paid the ransom. Amen. Amen. For, the, for the Holy Spirit to be able to work in your life, grace will set you free. But if we attempt to trust in our own strength or if we refuse to submit to God's will and demand our own will, don't wonder why it feels like the grace is absent. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever been yeah, there? Yeah. Don't, don't, don't blame it on God. No, instead, ask yourself a really important question. And I do this to myself a lot. Did I set grace aside? Did I put my faith in the wrong thing? Did I hold on to something that I wasn't supposed to hold on to? Why is it that grace is so frustrated in my life right now? Why do I feel chaos? Why do I feel confusion? Why do I feel frustration? 